Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. In the last 30 years, we have witnessed a serious decline in American cities. Some recent developments offer some hope for the future, but how did we get so close to collapse? Joining us to look at that question are Fred Siegel, professor at the Cooper Union for the Arts and Sciences, senior fellow at the Progressive Policy Institute, and author of the new book, the future once happened here, New York, D.C., L.A., and the fate of America's big cities. And Adam Yarmolinsky, Regents Professor of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, former advisor to President Lyndon Johnson, and author of a recent critical review of Professor Siegel's new book. The topics before this house, what ruined the cities, what can save the cities, this week on Think Tank. America's great cities were once called the soul of the nation. Their promise and prospects blossomed after the Industrial Revolution had transformed the country. Early in this century, urban America helped assimilate millions of immigrants, providing opportunity and prosperity for Europe's sons and daughters. The growth of the great American cities proved fertile soil for American liberalism, which found its fullest expression in the New Deal spirit of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Cities thrived for the first half of the 20th century as the hubs of commerce, manufacturing, arts, and entertainment. As their populations grew, they became more powerful politically. But something went wrong. The last 30 years have witnessed a staggering decline in the health of America's cities. Riots rocked urban areas in the 1960s and again in the early 1990s, most famously in Los Angeles. Violent crime exploded in inner city areas across the country. Many possible culprits have been identified. It was the automobile. It was the suburbs and the malls. It was the south to north migration of poor people. It was white flight. It was black flight. It was crime. It was deindustrialization. But Professor Fred Siegel argues that one thing was principally responsible, modern liberalism. He marshals a powerful case and sees hopeful signs on the horizon for a renewal. It's a controversial thesis, but Fred Siegel's book is an important one and deserves serious consideration. Our cities are at stake. Gentlemen, Thank you for joining us. Uh, Adam Yarmolinsky, let me ask you just to hold on for a minute. Let Fred Siegel uh, drive this bus. It's his book. Fred, what are you talking about? My thesis is that while uh, cities were faced with certain elements out of their control, uh, trucks and telephones decentralized economic activity, that cities took a difficult situation, made them far worse by their own policies. And uh, principally, three, three great gambles took place in the 1960s. The first great gamble was the gamble of replacing work with welfare. In the midst of the greatest prosperity in America had ever known, at a time when New York City had 4% black male unemployment, it decided to quadruple the welfare rules. The second had to do with acculturation. Um, people who argue that uh, race and racism were the only important factors in, in holding back the advancement of African Americans left out the fact that people who came from impoverished, rural, semi-literate backgrounds, often illiterate backgrounds, had to be acculturated to an urban industrial economy. Typically in the South, fr from the from South. From the South to the northern cities. The, the collapse of the northern public school systems, uh, symbolized in New York by the Ocean Hill-Brownsville conflict, in which the idea of acculturation was thrown away in favor of the idea of black power in the schools. That was something that would then spread to much of the rest of the country. And the third great gamble, so we, we gamble on giving up the idea of acculturation. The third great gamble had to do with public order. The notion that, there was the notion in the 60s developed by sociologists who talked about victimless crime, and then picked up by police chiefs and others and lawyers, that if you ignored low-level crime, if you only concentrated on major crime, um, 
violent life, violence in the cities could be reduced. In fact, what happened is we got the boast, worst of both worlds. Low-level crime flourished, and out of low-level crime came higher and higher levels of violence and disorder. And since cities are places that depend on public spaces, depend on people interacting with each other for enjoying city life, the collapse of, lo of local order, the collapse of public life on the streets of the cities drove, helped drive the cities down. You're talking about the causes, welfare, the lack of acculturation, uh, criminality, uh, but, but you have a specific political villain in your book. Why, to, wh why don't you say the L word and, and let's get it out there <laughs> well, so when, when Adam goes ballistic we, we know what we're talking well, about. In, in order to talk about the destructive qualities of modern liberalism, you have to look at the earlier liberalism. Liberalism, repre liberalism represented by someone like Fiorella LaGuardia was reciprocal. Who was the mayor of, the New, mayor of New York in the 1930s and the symbol of American urban liberalism. Uh, for LaGuardia, liberalism for LaGuardia meant the city would help you if you were in need, but you were obliga obligated to live by the rules. You were obligated to do your best to earn a living and, and live a productive life. If, you, if that, that things didn't work out and you needed help, it would be provided. What happened under Mayor John Lindsay, who was mayor of New York in the 1960s, during that fourfold increase of welfare, the collapse of the schools and the collapse of public order. Lindsay is a synonym for liberal disaster. Uh, what happened under Lindsay is those two halves were detached. Modern liberalism became a, a question of the state had the obligation to provide for you. You were entitled, but you weren't obliged to return anything. You were entitled to state benefits, but you weren't obligated to provide to work hard or live by the rules. And there's the classic case of the famous case of the welfare mother who says to Lindsay, I have six children by six different fathers. It's your job to support them. It's my job to bring them into the world. That was a recipe for disaster, because what that produced was that, both... That was an actual quote reported by uh, Roger Starr of the right. New York Times. Who attended right? a press conference where this, woman, where this woman said this to Lindsay. And there are other examples of this that you can, you can now, multiply. Let, 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 me, let me ask you a question. Your book, uh, so far the examples you've talked about are from New York City, but you deal also specifically with Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. Yes. Same deal? Uh, to different degrees. Washington, everything that went wrong in New York went much more wrong in Washington. Uh, Washington is the case of the total meltdown, where nothing works. And the interesting thing about Washington is it's a city that's overflowing with money. For every dollar Washington pays into the federal treasury, it gets five dollars back. The city can't spend the money it has. Uh, nonetheless, public services have broken down under Marion Barry, a kind of gangster mayor, have broken down almost completely. Um, so when liberals argue that the only problem with urban liberalism, if only there was more money, you know, it was short change. If more money had been given to the cities from the federal government, things could have worked. You can look at uh, Washington and what, say... What about Los Angeles? Quickly, and then we will bring well, in uh, Professor uh, Yarmolinsky. Los Angeles there. is a special case because Los Angeles liberals <coughs> failed for diff very different reasons. They failed to deal with the problem of, of the police. For a very complicated set of reasons, the police in L.A. are independent, became independent of, of politicians and accountability. They went into business for themselves. And Los Angeles had two great riots that helped help set the tone for the 60s. The Watts riot really sets the 60s off in their worst phase of, of breakdown and, and the federal government responding by paying people off not to riot. And what's interesting about Los Angeles is that the 90, 1992 Los Angeles riots signal the end, in some sense, of widespread support for modern liberalism. Because at the end of the 92 riot, there was no money forthcoming. After the 65 riot, the federal government rushed out to say, how can we prevent more riots? Let's, let's invest in riot insurance. After 92, there was silence. Nothing happened. And the other very good thing that happened out of the 1992 riots the Los Angeles style of policing, the kind of paramilitary, kiss the concrete style of policing, was totally discredited. Earlier, the liberal style of policing, the New York passive ACLU style, whereby we don't bother you, the criminals much and the ACLU doesn't bother the police much, only the citizenry suffers. That had already been discredited. Okay, all right. Uh, Adam Yarmolinsky, you, you have been around this game uh, for a long time, going, going back to the war on poverty with Presidents Kennedy and President Johnson. Uh, you wrote a review of Fred Siegel's book in the Washington Monthly, which, uh, while it was partially complimentary, was essentially negative. What is your problem with, with that thesis? He, he is saying that the root of the decline of the cities came out of the mentality of modern liberalism. Well, uh, it seems to me that this notion of the mentality of modern liberalism uh, 
tell it to a ghetto or a slum dweller, uh, and I don't think that they would say that they had been treated the way the ACLU would like them to be treated, nor do I think that they would have found welfare a satisfactory way of life. I, there, there's, a, there's an artifact here uh, that I don't think exists, and what I'm afraid particularly troubled me about Fred's book uh, is, that, is a kind of a nostalgia for a world that never was. Uh, I've lived in Washington since on and off since 1950, uh, and I don't remember Washington of 1950 as being a better place to live, particularly for poor people or black people, uh, than it is today. Indeed, it was worse. Uh, when I went into the Pentagon in 1961, the only place I could take a black friend to lunch was the Secretary of Defense mess, which I was fortunate enough to belong to. Uh, that's a small example, but I, putting this all on the shoulders of us poor liberals, and I'm uh, proud to continue to call myself a liberal, uh, because I think uh, liberals are people who care about other people who are in trouble. And I see nothing wrong with that. The, the crime rate in Washington when you came here was probably one-fifth of what it is today, the violent crime know, rate. I don't know what the crime rate was, but I certainly don't think that there was, any, there was anything in the way uh, the government operated or uh, the police force or uh, either local government or national government, which resulted in the uh, enormous increase in the crime rate. Adam is wrong on each and every point. <laughs> uh, so that's why you're, that's why you, these are the two guys on the show. Right, go ahead. Look, uh, liberals' finest moment was when they broke the barriers of segregation. The problems of New York, however, were never problems. So he, he's right about what he says about racism, segregation racism. in Washington. It was legal, it was, it was, it was immoral. Legal, it was, but let's take, let's take a look at the schools. The schools in Washington in the 1950s were integrated, successful, a whole range of academics, well-known ac contemporary academics, came out of the Washington public schools. Today, oh, no, wait, wait. The, the schools in Washington were not integrated. They were until integrated in 1954. Okay. They were integrated, one of the first school systems to be integrated, and they were a successful model of integration, and they were a model of acculturation. You were taking people from the isolated areas of the rural south and bringing them into the larger world. That system was destroyed in the 1960s by liberals like Mr. Yarmolinsky. Now, right. as we what, take... What the, should I do? I uh, 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 oh, uh, I, on the contrary. We can get into that in a second, but let me, let me, go, right. let me go forward. Yeah. He, he asked a pretty good yeah. question. Adam said, what did I do? Well, what, 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 what yeah. is poor? He's a nice yes. looking guy. I've known I him for a lot of years. What did he do? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. No, no, I'll, 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 we, we can talk. As a member of the Johnson administration, he essentially bought into the idea that the problem of the people coming off from these rural backgrounds was solely racism, that they were fully oh. competent to navigate urban life, and that the Office of Economic Opportunity, the job of the Office of Economic Opportunity was to act as a ginger group in the cities to break down the bad old political machines that were supposedly holding back black progress. What they did was create patronage organizations of the sort that exist here in D.C. The kind of patronage organizations Marion Barry lived off to, lived off, lives off of, Mr. Yarmolinsky helped create 35 years ago. I, uh, I, I, I Unintentionally, perhaps. <laughs> Throw me on it. Thanks. Glad to hear you don't think it was intentional. Right, right. No, I have to deny the soft impeachment. Uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity did not assume that the only problem was racism. In fact, I've written on this subject and on a number of occasions observed that the problem of poverty with which the Office of Economic Opportunity and the whole poverty program uh, was created was not seen by its creators as being primarily a black problem at all. Now, Fred, Fred let, me, let me just interject. You, you know I... I think very highly of your book, and I've written uh, about it. But I, 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 we, we don't only have one member, former member of the Johnson oh, administration. We, we have another one. Uh, I think on that particular point, uh, uh, Adam is right. I mean, the war on poverty, and, and what the Great Society tried to do about poverty. What you're talking about, the the CAP programs, the Community Action right. Programs, were one tiny sliver of, of that whole panoply of programs, and I sort of agree with you, they certainly got out of hand, although they were not designed to do what they did. Um, but, but it was but reasonably the, clear to me that the reason uh, that the, uh, the, the economic opportunity program, the community action program, didn't make it was, well really it was Vietnam, because the whole program was premised on the idea that it would grow. And when, when funding was cut off and you were developing new programs in cities around the country and 
all the new programs were fighting with the existing programs, which wanted to expand a little bit. Well, the new programs wanted enough with money to get started. On poor people right through the Vietnam War per person were going like that. But the f I mean, that, that is mythology, the, no. and I, I was I was in that administration. But been the funding for the the community action program almost immediately leveled off. Yeah, but not for poverty generally. Go ahead, No, Fred. but that's you're, a different... Look, uh, you're, you're dying One here, particular yeah, program right. might not have got as much funding, right. but Washington, one of the reasons Washington, D.C. is this pathological mess it's in is that every great society program ever created got, took root here and stayed and was never accountable. It became a patronage source for Marion, for Marion Barry. It became a source of his campaign workers. A number of the more encouraging uh, programs going down the middle of the road uh, were frustrated uh, because you had this criticism from the extreme left, but that wasn't what the government was trying to do, and I don't think you can pin that tail on the liberal donkey. The tragedy of the welfare explosion was at exactly the time when there was a demand for labor, when there was a chance for African Americans to get on the up escalator. They're pulled out of the economy, shunted off into welfare, and what you get is a double disaster further family breakdown and a fiscal meltdown for the cities that have to support these, these broken families. Adam brought it up. Uh, part two, we've had the argument about what happened. Uh, Adam has accused you of being a professional nostalgist, and looking only backwards, but I know that you want to look forward. I know that you want to look forward. Lord knows I want to look forward. Let's start with you. Uh, what should we be doing now for and to our cities? Well, one of, the thing, one of the things we want to do is get the federal government off the back of the cities. There's this idea that the federal government is here to help the cities. But federal policy, most, in most cases, Washington, D.C. is the exception of killing with kindness, holds the cities at a disadvantage through highway funding, through mortgage guarantees. The cities are actually harmed by the federal you, government. You mean that the federal government uh, encouraged the, the growth of suburban Absolutely. Urban spread. Absolutely. Urban sprawl. And sprawl. you can think about it for a simple reason. The Senate is heavily stacked to the empty quarter of the United States, to rural interests. But having, having said that, Ben, I think what cities have to do is look less to Washington and more to themselves. And they have to look to develop the talents of their own people. Instead of saying, let me sell my pathology to Washington, they want to say, what kind of industries can I develop with the people I have here? They have talents, they have capacities. How do I bring them back into the economy, bring them back into the economic mainstream? And to do that, the federal government is by and large, not always, by and large, not very, very useful. Your, your, your philosophy, as you described it, again, talking about the past, was that liberalism uh, b became dependent individualism. That's right. Uh, a, a, that it encouraged the cities to become dependent, uh, on the economic side, dependent wards of state and federal. That's right. And at the same time, gave a free market for moral values and things like that. So what you are saying is to get off the federal teat. Exactly. And because what, when, when, when the federal government subsidizes pathology, in a sense, through matching funds, it, it, it leads cities to not look at their citizens as assets in the sense of, their, of, their, of terms of what they can produce, what they can... Cities were great when people were productive, when they were so, centers so, of so, labor. So you are saying that cities like the rest of the country should become more market-oriented in the world of commerce. Well, I don't know that the rest of the, the, rest of the country is rather market-oriented. Right. The cities are the exception. That's right. And it's not an accident that the cities have fallen behind, in a sense, because they haven't, they okay. haven't adapted uh, to the new okay. economy. So that's, that's that point one. Do you, do, 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 you, do you buy uh, that? Uh, you, no, you think I, that's I, a good I, idea? I, I really don't think I do. Uh, because I think if you look at uh, federal subsidies, uh, just a dollar volume, uh, I suspect a lot more, and I think that I think figure the, the overall statistics bear out the proposition that a lot more goes to rural areas. Now, most of it goes to uh, agribusiness, but when you consider what goes to uh, various kinds of corporate farmers, including tobacco farmers, uh, and what goes to uh, cattle. Cattlemen. I mean, you, a dollar. What is it? A dollar an acre rent for acres that should rent for ten times that. Uh, that the cities are getting the short end of the stick. And what's interesting about the three cities I studied—New York, Washington, and Los Angeles—is that one of those three cities has a dynamic economy. 
Uh, Los Angeles has an extraordinary economy, able to recreate itself over and over. Los Angeles took a tremendous hit in the early 90s when the defense industries were downsized. It came back. It came back with high-tech uh, digital, digital industries, came back with food processing at the lower end. And what you, see, what you see going on in Los Angeles now among Mexican-Americans is something that's very, very encouraging. People, new arrivals, very poor people, making it up the ladder in the traditional way. I talk about a town called Huntington Park near Los Angeles in Los Angeles County where people group together, cousins, brothers, etc., etc., buy a house together and begin to get a foothold in American life. It's a, that dynamic economy is the best way to move people out of, of poverty. The problem of New York, even under Rudy Giuliani, is that the economy is entirely dependent on Wall Street. The rest of the economy is dead in the water. We have an immigrant city in New York without the kind of immigrant economy and immigrant dynamism that Los Angeles benefits we're, we're, from. We're looking at the future. We're looking at the future of the cities. Do you think that we are seeing less crime in the cities because we have put more people in jail? No. No. Do you think we are seeing less crime in the cities because we have put more people in jail? Unquestionably. That's one element. <laughs> well, that's that's one that. element of what's one. You know, one of the interesting things about Mario Cuomo was he built jails like crazy, helped drop the crime rate, but was too embarrassed to ever take the credit for it because he, he would be, you know, he would be calumnied by his fellow liberals. The, there's not, Mr. Yarmolinsky's right in one. In other words, if, if you put a thug in jail, an extra thug in jail, who, according to a Brookings Institution study, that thug worry out on the street would commit 14 violent crimes. I'm all for putting the people you cannot deal with otherwise. What concerns me so, so is that most of the people in jail are not violent criminals. We fail, we, we, we... Nine, over 90 percent are either violent criminals or repeat offenders, one or the well, other. Repeat offenders is a different story. Well, there, there are people who, who, who are saying the law doesn't mean anything and I'm going to keep breaking it. No. But no. the biggest, the biggest change has been the broken let, windows let, business. Let, yeah. let, let Adam finish. Go ahead. The, the people who are not violent criminals, there, there are an awful lot of things that, that could be done, and we'll never know whether they work until we try them. Uh, but those programs have been tried, Adam. They've been tried again and again, no. and you have a very high rate of recidivism. They, the uh, amount of experiment is, in my view, is so limited compared to just the, the just throw them in jail philosophy okay. which Go I don't ahead. think we just I don't think we should just throw people in jail what's interesting about why crime has dropped in New York it really comes from a guy named George Kelling uh, Kelling understood that the real job of the police is not to catch criminals it's to prevent crime from happening in the first place by maintaining public order and and, and the great success in New York by under Bill Bratton and Rudy Giuliani has been to institute Bratton was the police. Was commission. the first police commissioner under Julian? Who has was been fired by Julian? Who has been instituted? As, and, but after he successfully instituted right. these changes, the key to this is that you don't allow local disorder. You don't allow small problems to turn into large ones. If you see a drug market developing in a place, stop it. The famous example of this is turnstile jumpers. When Bratton was head of the transit police in New York, he discovered, thanks to Kelling, that one out of seven people who jumped the turnstiles were wanted on outstanding felony warrants. Terrific. You, you police the small crime, you reduce the major crime. Crime, well, the first year of this program, dropped 40% in the New York City subways. The, the beauty of, of, the, of the broken windows thesis is it doesn't require tough guy policing. It requires intelligent policing. Well, it requires police who know where the problems are and feed that back to a central headquarters that can quickly respond so that, so that when a drug market develops, it's not allowed to take root. I, final, final, final question. Quick answer. It's 1997, I wave my magic wand, it's the year 2007, 10 years from now, where are we going to be on the cities, Adam Yarmolinsky? I suspect, uh, because uh, the best predictor of where things will be in the future is where they are now, that we'll be about in the same place. I hope not. Uh, I hope that some of the more aggressive and imaginative people will be able to persuade their uh, political masters uh, to make some significant changes, but I'm not terribly optimistic. Fred Siegel. I think it'll be a mixed picture. I think the kind of innovative mayors we see around the country, guys like Norquist in Milwaukee, Goldsmith in Indianapolis, uh, these guys, there'll be more of them. There'll be more mayors will be willing to experiment, willing to try new, new ways of doing things, break out of the old bureaucratic habits. But I think some cities will inevitably continue to fade. Buffalo will probably be part of a county instead of an independent city. Uh, Gary will be no more. 
uh, and other cities will be thriving. Cities like Seattle, Phoenix, uh, San Diego will be thriving in the future. So it'll be a very mixed picture. Okay, Fred Siegel, thank you very much. Adam Yarmolinsky, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media which are solely responsible for its content.